Welcome back to the Thinking Crypto Podcast, your home for cryptocurrency news and interviews. If you are new here, please hit that subscribe button as well as a thumbs up button and leave a comment below. If you're listening on a podcast platform such as Spotify, Apple, or Google, please leave a five-star rating and review. It supports the podcast and it doesn't cost you anything. This content is brought to you by Uphold, which makes crypto investing easy. I've been a user of Uphold since 2017. I can vouch for this platform having used it for years. They have 10 plus million users, 250 plus cryptocurrencies, and they're available in 150 countries. You can also trade precious metals and equities on Uphold. If you'd like to learn more, please visit the link in the description. Well, folks, I want to let you all know about a big congressional hearing coming up this week. It will be on Wednesday, May 10th. This is an important one. The title of this hearing is The Future of Digital Assets, Measuring the Regulatory Gaps in the Digital Asset Markets. And it's going to include, and shout out to Eleanor Tourette of Fox Business, it's going to include the House Agriculture Committee on the GOP side, and of course, the House Financial Committee, which is also on the GOP side. And if you recall, about about two weeks ago, the House Financial Services Committee, they met with Gary Genser and grilled the hell out of him, right? Shout out to Patrick McHenry, Tom Emmer, Warren Davidson, Bill Heisinga, and many more. And they were asking Gary laser-targeted questions. Is Ethereum a security? Is XRP is a security? Where are the FTX documents? They made Gary Genser look like a fool. So this is really great to see that we're having another hearing on crypto, uh, you know, literally within weeks of that one that took place. And you may say, well, why is this important? Well, remember the, the chairman of the House Financial Committee, Patrick McHenry, just said a consensus. He expects to put out a comprehensive crypto bill within two months. So it's great to see they're bringing in all these folks. They're having the hearings, guys, because part of the process is to meet, is to have dialogue, to have discussions, right? That is so important. And here, Eleanor Tourette highlighted uh, you know, some of the preliminary witnesses. Uh, here's the list. Andrew Durge, head of Republic Crypto. Matthew Culkin, former director of the CFTC's Division of Swap Dealer and Intermediary Oversight. Dan Berkowitz, former SEC GC, I think general counsel, and former uh, CFTC commissioner. Marco Santori, Kraken uh, chief legal officer. This is an important one. Kraken just, of course, settled with the SEC regarding staking, right? I'm sure Marco is going to have a lot to say. I'm actually going to try to get Marco on the podcast. So uh, here we also have Daniel Schoenberger, if I'm saying that right. Apologize, Daniel, if I'm butchering your name. Uh, he is the Web3 Foundation Foundation Chief Legal Officer. So you got a lot of people here who are on the legal side. See, you see the theme here, folks, right? This is the path towards comprehensive regulations. I am not saying we're going to get crypto regulations next month or even two months from now. It's probably going to be into next year, but this is the path to it. So this is why these things are so important. And I'm going to be watching this. I'm, of course, going to you know get the major takeaways for you guys and summarize it. But of course, you can watch it. You can stream it. It'll be live on YouTube. And uh, this is once again, really important. The fact that we're having these hearings about crypto, we need more of them because right now the industry is under attack from that clown, corrupt, scumbag regulator, Gary Genser. Now, here's some other interesting crypto regulation news. So we all know New York has been very strict on crypto. Uh, they were part of you know the attack on Paxos, naming Ethereum being a security uh, in, in many different lawsuits, right? And they shut down BUSD and so forth. Now, I believe, as I've said many times, in comprehensive regulations that are balanced, stop the bad actors, but don't kill the good actors who are just trying to innovate, who are just trying to build, entrepreneurs trying to build technology and businesses, right? That's the balance we're missing. Well, here we got a report from the New York Attorney General. Here's the headline. Crypto's rampant fraud and dysfunction needs law and order, New York Attorney General says. New York Attorney General Latia James tackles crypto in new proposal. So uh, she's plans to bring a bill to the state legislators next month that would require crypto companies to complete audits, submit financial statements, and increase fraud protection. Now, on its face, without me seeing all the details, that makes sense. 
I am for crypto companies to be transparent, provide audits, show they have the reserves, show they have the proper checks and balances, right? That's so important. Just look at what happened with Celsius. Look at what happened to FTX. If we had this type of reporting, it would have prevented a lot of the fraud, right? So I'm in agreement because there are bad actors. However, we need to see the details. Oh, the devil is in the details, right, guys? We need to see what is it that they're asking because there's a line you can't, you you shouldn't cross that would be, uh, you know, could stifle this innovation because there's nuances with DeFi and how uh, blockchain reporting can be done and so forth. So here's a quote, rampant fraud and dysfunction have become the hallmarks of the cryptocurrency, and it is time to bring law and order to the multi-billion dollar industry, James wrote in a statement on Friday. The proposal or the proposed bill known as the Crypto Regulation Protection Transparency and Oversight Act, or CRPTO, I see what you did there, <laughs> also includes new rules around custody and lending, increasing scrutiny around which companies are allowed to hold assets and facilitate leverage trading. That, once again, on its face, makes sense to me, because just look at what's happening with Genesis uh, Trading and Gemini, right? And Gemini, we know, is based in New York, so... I think uh, Grayscale is as well, or Digital Currency Group is also based in New York. So I, I agree. We need to put these things in order. If you are running a proper business, just show your audits. Just show uh, your your reserves and everything is is running great, and you have insurance. And you know uh, the, the people you're working with also have insurance. They also have reserves. All these things are important. The news comes as lawmakers across the country continue to disagree on how to oversee the growing crypto industry. New York leaders have maintained their approach to cryptocurrency regulation is one of the most or more advanced in the United States. The state rolled out its bit license in 2015, a policy that prompted some companies to cease operating in the state. Since then, other states, including Illinois and New Jersey, have expressed interest in passing similar regulations based on New York's framework. The only thing I don't like about the bit license is that it became more about gatekeeping because there was a lot of crypto companies that filed for the applications, but they were waiting forever. So that's a problem. You can't just roadblock them. If you if you think that they don't deserve a bit license, you can let them know. But there were many companies, it took them years to get a bit license and they were just simply waiting. It wasn't like they were having back and forth. So the problem is with this bit license is they need to improve the efficiency of it and you know not, not approving it. Now, Representative Richie Torres, Democrat out of New York, said he would not be inclined to support any legislation that undermine New York's current stablecoin regulatory policy during an April stablecoin hearing in the House. Now, Richie Torres has been a friend of crypto, pro-crypto. He's one of the few Democrats that gets it, and uh, I, I hope to interview him someday. And he's been working with different uh, members on the other side of the aisle to get proper regulations. So some New York reg uh, state regulators have taken what the industry sees as a slightly more crypto-friendly approach. During April's hearing, witness Adrian uh, Harris, superintendent of New York State Department of Financial Services, countered a popular narrative that crypto is to blame for the recent banking crisis or collapses. Uh, she said, it's a misnomer that the failure of Signature Bank was related to crypto, Harris said during the hearing in response to a question from Representative Maxine Waters, a uh, Democrat out of California, about crypto's role in the banking crisis. So folks, we'll we'll see. Um, I'm going to try to see what Richie Torres thinks about this bill and uh, if it's something that you know makes sense. On its face, from what I'm reading, it makes sense. This doesn't seem like any type of draconian uh, law, you know. And once again, it's it's always the details. How are they going to, uh, you know, do these things, and what are they requiring the companies to to bring to the table? You know, simply doing audits and check of proof of reserves and you know proper security and fraud prevention. You know, those things make sense. That that's not hard. But sometimes they they want like. Uh, the nitty gritty of some sort of blockchain reporting, which some of these companies can't do because there are many things that run on DeFi. So we have to figure this out. And uh, hopefully this is something that, you know, if it's a good bill, sets a standard and then other companies, or I should say other states can adopt it. And even the federal government, right? Maybe Richie Torres can work with other members of Congress and they make this a federal thing. We'll see. Now, 
Uh, here's some updates that I want to share with you guys around. Will Coinbase relist XRP? There are many people who are upset at Coinbase for delisting XRP. You know, I've spoken to Paul Grewal at Coinbase. And look, I am one who I, I understand why Coinbase has not relisted XRP. It's too big of a risk. And, uh, you know, they're a public publicly traded company. And Bill Morgan, who is a lawyer here, he tweeted out the following and he really uh, highlighted why they're not going to do that until this case is over. So he says, no, a Coinbase XRP listing will not follow. This is because uh, recently Paul Grewal and Stuart Alorati of Ripple met. So uh, folks were speculating, oh, maybe a relisting is happening. But uh, Bill says, why would Ripple expect Coinbase to relist XRP when in the last few weeks, Ripple decided not to use XRP in Ripple's own liquidity hub service? The meeting was more likely about how Ripple could assist Coinbase in either its petition or uh, for a right of mandamus and or writ of mandamus, I should say, and or its defense to an SEC enforcement action. Coinbase's different treatment of XRP halting secondary market sales on ex its exchange than any other digital asset traded on its exchange that the SEC has alleged in its lawsuit our securities will continue. So he's right here because there's just too much of a risk. And, you know, many times it's not okay that they don't want to relist XRP. It's, it's not an emotional thing for them. It's their lawyers are saying, hey, it's not worth it because the risk is too high. N maybe nothing happens, right? But the, the, there is a high po probability of something happening to, to us and we could lose certain statuses and licenses. That's the type of the meetings and you know things that are shared internally. On it, you know, on the outside, many folks are tweeting, "Oh, they should relist XRP. They should do this." The problem is, um, there's so many things at risk, right? Uh, and and that could impact their partners, their banking partners, because the banking partners may say, "Hey, we don't want to be involved with anything that." It has to do with the selling or buying of XRP because we don't want to get sued and we don't want to get some sort of issue with the SEC. But the root cause is 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 the SEC here, right? So folks, you know, your anger and your frustration should be aimed at Gary Gensler and the SEC. Coinbase is a company. And if you've been within a company and you, you know, they have their risk department and they have to make their assessments, it's easy to say, hey, you should relist XRP you know, give the middle finger to the SEC. But at the end of the day, they're a business. They have to uh, run their operations. And, you know, if they do something, they they, they do a risk, they do a risk assessment to see uh, if it makes sense. And uh, a great point Bill is highlighting here, even Ripple is not doing that because they, they don't want to affect their uh, liquidity hub service. They're not even including XRP. So that tells you, the situation the SEC has caused, the confusion, the the fear, and and in the increased risk level uh, for anything involving XRP. That doesn't mean XRP is dead. That doesn't mean XRP won't eventually go back on Coinbase. It's just in, at this moment, while this lawsuit is still playing out, you know, folks are being passive. They're watching from the sidelines a bit. Now, funny enough, a alumni of Ripple, Ashish Birla, who's no longer with the company. Today, he tweeted out about Coinbase. He said, Coinbase is transitioning from crypto exchange to crypto-enabled banking services. Coinbase's updated mission is building the crypto economy, a more fair, accessible, efficient, and transparent financial system enabled by crypto. Per its Q1 2023 earnings transcript, revenue on deposits via interest income blockchain rewards and custodial fees now make up the lion's share of Coinbase revenues shown as a subscription and services revenue below. Uh, he says interest on USDC deposits is generating $199 million alone or about 18% of all Coinbase revenue. So right here, you can see why <laughs> uh, the SEC's gotten getting a, got a Wells notice, right? And we know the SEC also blocked their LEND program. So uh, this is clearly the incumbents fighting. This is taking away the power from the banking cartel, as we know it, the JP Morgans, the Citibank, and so forth. That's why we're in that then they fight you phase. Coinbase revenues are slowly shifting from customer or from consumer to high margin institutional 
customers. Institutional trading revenue increased 67% from last quarter. He said here, Coinbase also benefits from banking-like revenues that are less dependent on the overall crypto market. Uh, he says, with trust in traditional banking eroding, is the timing right for institutions and consumers to turn to alternatives? Hmm. Great, great question and summary of what's happening. But you just read this and you're like, yeah, I can see why uh, Coinbase of, uh, all of a sudden gets a Wells notice, right? They are disrupting the status quo. They are building a crypto-enabled banking service, so to speak. And once again, the incumbent banking uh, cartel folks don't like that. And who, of course, is you know the, the dog on the leash of these banking cartels? Goldman Gary Genser. So that tells you everything you need to know. Now, here's some interesting developments out of Argentina. So one one of the countries that has uh, one one of the craziest hyperinflation situations out there, right? Um, and here, this, their central bank halts cryptocurrencies from payment apps. The ban is intended to reduce Argentina's payment system exposure to digital assets, said the Monetary Authority. Want to guess why this is happening, folks? People are uh, avoiding and getting out of the hyperinflation and moving to cryptocurrencies. So all of a sudden, uh oh, oh no, we're losing our power, right? This is coming from the central bank. Uh, so we got to ban it. So, but we know they're not going to be able to. The genie is out the bottle. They, they can try to stop a few apps where people will find a way around it. Um, and and this is the problem with these you know countries that have totalitarianism and authoritarian governments. Uh, but the people will find a way. They will find a way. Now, Saifuddin Amus, uh, he weighed in on this. He said, such moves do not ban Bitcoin. They only make your currency and banking systems less liquid and their users more aware of the fact that your currency is a loyalty point scheme and not money. Uh, so he's absolutely right there. But, you know, at some point, they're going to have to roll this back. I said it many times over the years. You, any country that bans this technology, they're writing a death sentence to their economy, their their growth uh, over the years, guys, because this is the future. Um, many times you may see, you know, a kind of an initial knee-jerk reaction, ban, oh, we need to stop it, we need to control it. We saw this in India, right? Now India is a bit more open for businesses, uh, more crypto companies are coming in. So it's a lot, it's a battle, right? You're going to see a lot of uh, seesawing here, uh, back and forth, and uh, eventually they're going to have to stop it. They're going to have to stop the ban, I should say, or get rid of the ban because they're only going to shoot themselves in the foot. All right, guys, let me know what you think about this news and the upcoming hearing next week. It looks like this is going to be a big one. Remember, this is the part, the path to crypto regulations. We have to have them, the hearings, the dialogue, and so forth. And I'll talk to you all later. Mm -hmm.